You're listening to the Modern Saxophonist Podcast. Welcome to the Modern Saxophonist Podcast. I'm your host, Mark MacArthur, and you're listening to the Monday Masterclass. Today, we are have a special, special masterclass with, uh, with our buddy, John Winteringham, and uh, we just had a, uh, a great, great um, episode that you should, you should tune in and listen to that's already out there for you. And uh, just to get introduced to him, but John, how you doing? Great, looking forward to it. Yeah, and, and, and everyone, uh, Eric Bradley, my co-host, is on here. So, Eric, hello again, Mark and John. Yeah. Well, take it away, John. All right, Mark. Well, what, basically, what I wanted to do today is just talk a little bit about programming, and it's a pretty vast subject, um, so we won't touch on all the topics, but. Um, I think it's something on the minds of a lot of, well, saxophonists of all ages, middle school, high school, anyone who's going out and performing in any kind of setting. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's, you know, one, one of my strengths as a, as a performer is my approach to programming. And I think it's, it's a weakness for, for many saxophonists because of our, our heritage as soloists and because of how we grow up and, and the academia um, kind of circle that we go through. Um, but I just wanted to, to give a little insight into my process in case it's helpful for some of the people listening and to talk about my approach to programming, some of the kind of tips and tricks that I've learned from, you know, the hundreds of, of concerts that I've done. Um, so I, I think one of, the, one of the major aspects of it is to think very clearly about and to define the components of what you believe a successful program is. Um, you know, of, of course, this is different for everybody, it's certainly based on you know, personal experience and preferences. Um, but go through and, and think about the concerts that you've uh, been an audience member of, that you've participated in, and, 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 and just you know, go through and rack your brain and find out what, what concerts have really moved you as an audience member? What concerts have you performed in that you've really felt passionate about, that you felt like you had something to offer? And, um, you know, pick one of the more memorable concerts that you've participated in or that you've listened to and, and go through and try and define what it was about that concert that made it a memorable experience. What it was that you loved? Was it the music? Was it the performer? If it was the music, why? If it was the performer, why? You know, just diagnose the aspects of the program that, that you found enjoyable, that you found moving. And then try and apply them to to the program that you're trying to create. So one of you know one of the biggest things when we're talking about programming is everyone says know your audience, and you know that's absolutely true. We program differently for every single context you know that, that we have the opportunity to do. If you're doing you know an institutional concert, if you're a guest artist at a university, a degree recital for some of the students out there, commercial concerts, if you're getting paid to play on you know concert series or a promoted recital, or if you're renting out a hall, outreach for you know, high schools, middle schools, retirement communities, churches, um, you know, all these things we program differently and all these things we base the repertoire that we choose on, on what we anticipate in, in the, the recital, what we anticipate the audience enjoying and liking. Um, and that's not to say that you want to go out there and you want to choose music that you don't believe in, but it's saying, you know, out of a really wide range of repertoire out there that you select music that you believe in that's a little more appropriate for the specific listener. Um, and, you know, that's something even as simple as, as knowing the appropriate length of the concert you're expected to perform. Um, you know, sometimes the venue determines that or the concert series or the presenter. Um, but, you know, location determines a lot, too. You know, in, in Asia, I, I perform a lot in Japan, and concerts are expected to be a two-hour event there. If you did that here, people would leave at intermission. You know, it's just far too long, as I'm sure you guys, <laughs> you guys know. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, so just knowing Seems all these be details... Sorry, go ahead. I oh, know I was going to say this seems to in in the states the only uh, only area that that those two hour concerts for a recital seems to happen. It, it seems to be every guest uh, guest piano recital that happens to come come through UNLV. <laughs> <laughs> so well, and that's so, the thing. I mean, you know, occasionally we are willing to sit down and listen to a two hour recital here, but it's 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 the you know the Stephen Schicks out there, the Attack Perlmans. It's it's the the real game changers that we're, we're willing to sit down and listen to two, for, for two hours. 
Um, but yeah, so I mean, just just even thinking about these things in advance, you're already ahead of the game. A lot of people don't don't even consider, <clears throat> excuse me, these concepts. So knowing the appropriate length of the recital, knowing who your target audience is, can can absolutely help you determine what repertoire you think is appropriate. Um, so speaking of repertoire. You, you know, one of the things that, as saxophonists, we're, we're quite limited. We don't have the Bachs and the Beethovens and the Rachmaninoffs, and, you know, we're, we're very limited in that sense that our instrument is, is quite young. It's only about 170 years old now. Um, so do we, you know, when we're looking at repertoire, do we want to program all saxophone repertoire, knowing that we have that weakness, that we can't offer the same kind of variety that any of the other major instruments can? Um, or do we want to, you know, do we want to program just court repertoire? Um, when I say core repertoire, I mean what we consider our standard repertoire, the Glazunovs, the Crestons, and Maurice. Um, y you know, we're talking to a bunch of saxophonists, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and then when we think about that repertoire, does it hold up to a violinist repertoire, a pianist, or cellist repertoire? And in, in many situations, the answer is no. You know, a Glazunov does not hold up to the Elgar Cello Concerto, in, in my opinion. It's just... I, I mean, even even for the sake of argument, just the youth of the repertoire itself. We don't have the history and the heritage of a piece like Bach. You know, if someone goes out and plays one of the Bach cello suites, that's, no one's going to question that. Someone goes out and plays the Creston Sonata in a concert, you don't see that too often. Um, <clears throat> but another thing that we look at when we realize how limited we are by the, peri the, the youth of our instrument is, is period repertoire, transcriptions, arrangements. Um, and I think one of the weaknesses that saxophonists have is we often limit ourselves to published transcriptions. I think it's very important to have a good balance to play period music, to play Bach, to play things like this, um, you know, as an aspect of a program. But too many of us get so excited by a published transcription of another piece that we didn't know about that we forget that that was transcribed by someone specifically with their own playing in mind, their own sound in mind. So one of the, the big things in, in my career that, that I've done is I've explored violin repertoire, vocal repertoire, cello repertoire, clarinet repertoire. I find the music that saxophonists don't really know about, that we should, by the way, um, and, I, and I, I find the music that speaks to me as a person that I believe in and that I feel like I have something to offer, and then I decide if it's going to, um, to work idiomatically on the saxophone. But doing your own transcriptions, doing your own arrangements is, is a crucial tool to who we are as artists because it allows us to write for ourselves in mind. It allows us to tailor the music to our own playing, to our own strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, I, I, I do a lot of arranging and a lot of transcribing, and I'm also very in tune with the other people that are that are doing similar things. And, you know, one of the things that's out there right now is the, the Saint-Saëns oboe sonata, and so many saxophonists are playing these, these days. And I, I love Saint-Saëns music. I think his violin sonata is one of the best pieces you know, I've, I've heard recently, and I, I, I believe in his music, but that oboe sonata is, is a terrible piece. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> his bassoon sonata is so much better. Yeah, well, and his D minor violin sonata is incredible. I'm, right. I'm working on that right now, and oh, I, nice. I can't wait to, to pretend I'm good enough to play it. But, um, but yeah, the oboe sonata, for example, is it's something that even oboists don't really believe in. But it's an accessible transcription. It's out there. People are emailing the PDFs. We have access to it, so we play it. We ignore the fact that there's better music out there because it's easy. Because it's easy to just say, yes, I'm going to play this music. It's a transcription. I'm going to study St. Psalms. I'm going to study oboe music. No, that's wrong. I'm sorry, that's wrong. If you don't believe in the music, don't program it. But anyway, the point is, is if, if you teach yourself the skills that you need or even just have the courage to experiment and to dive into your own transcribing, there's a whole world of possibilities out there. Um, I, I've recently transcribed or arranged a lot of uh, Grieg's, Edvard Grieg's lyric pieces, and I've done this kind of alongside Mike Jupstrom, my pianist um, and composer and collaborator. And we've ended up with, with, you know, four short pieces that work incredibly well for saxophone and piano that no one else is playing. And if we, we even briefly explore all the repertoire that's out there for various instruments, we realize there's there's a whole world of literature at our disposal that we're either not aware of or we're not willing to, to put in the work to transcribe. But my, my point in all of this is that there's there's a whole world of possibilities as far as programming and that we should explore all of them and we should search out music wholeheartedly that we believe in.
I couldn't agree more. Like you said, there's so much else out there. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was exposed to earlier is pian piano music. And one of the things I've been uh, transposing is uh, some of the uh, Chopin nocturnes. It's something mm -hmm. that's a part of me. It's uh, my mom played them when I was young. And that's that's one of my influences when I was young. So I, I, I get what you're saying, the, 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 the transcription music that's that's closest to you. Yeah, absolutely. And and you have that personal experience with the with the Chopin and you know, that's going to, to kind of influence who you are as a player and the things that you want to transcribe. And that's that's all I'm talking about with programming yeah. is finding that insight, finding that, that niche that you have that makes music personal. Because an audience picks up on that. They really do. When you believe in the music you're playing, it's you know, the audience can see that, they can hear that, they can feel that. Um but yeah, and, and I mean, you know, continuing on past transcriptions, in general, what we've been discussing so far is just increasing your awareness of repertoire. Um, and another way to do that for saxophone repertoire is, is find out who the leaders are in our field, follow them, follow their CDs, find out what repertoire they're playing. Look at the Tim McAllisters, the Claude Alongs, the Nobu Sagawas, these, these amazing artists out there, and see what rep is on their CDs. You know, I'm, I'm going to actually put a, put a call out. This just brought something to my mind. Uh, so I'm going to put a call out right now. Can we just start taking pictures of concert programs, putting it out uh, on what you're doing, just so that we know the repertoire that's out there that you're doing? Because I know you're not doing CDs of everything that you're doing, putting on your 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 recitals. Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. And and we need to start. We need to see what's happening out there today. Uh, so if you if you happen to be getting ready for recital, you're doing things. Uh, help us out. Um, help the saxophone community out. Let's see what you're doing. Well, that's one of the things that you can do is you can explore websites of the leading artists out there. And I'm not talking about just saxophonists. Do not limit yourself to just saxophonists because some of the best artists out there in the world are non-saxophonists. In fact, the majority of them are non-saxophonists. Right. Um, but go on their website and, and don't just look at the CDs, but look at, look at their um, events, look at their calendars, and look at the repertoire. Because most musicians out there, they list the repertoire being performed at each at each. Um, uh, concert so you can see what they're programming what they're programming in different contexts at different venues and and again you can get some really insightful ideas yeah yeah um, I, that's there's but but i i gotta tell you maybe this stokes somebody else to to start putting something together on this is that th this means that we all have to go out and do some research and we got to really be interested in this uh, but if there's somebody that wants to compile that, I'm not that person. But if there's somebody, <laughs> if there's somebody out there that wants to do that, there's a there's a good project. But we can at least agree on on the concept, and I think that is to make informed decisions when it comes to programming, you know, I, to do I the research, more, yeah. to to know the music, and and you know when you make your decisions, make sure you're making them for a reason, not just oh hey I'd love to play that piece at this point. Just like yeah, <laughs> a lot of people would like to play repertoire, but that doesn't mean other people want to listen to it. Um, but um, – and that's another thing is, is as much as you can feed off of all these ideas from everyone else, you want to be unique. You want to be individual. You don't want to play the same repertoire that everyone else is playing. You want to be exciting and have something individual to offer. Um, and and that's, that's a question that I think every musician faces and with great difficulty is asking yourself, what do you have to offer? What do you do better than – the countless other professional musicians out there. Why would someone want to come hear your concert as opposed to, you know, the, the other guy? Um, what music do you believe in? What personal, like we were discussing with you, Mark, what personal experiences do you have that would lead you to program this music? Um, what experiences do you have with composers of music that gives you an edge or a unique approach to the piece? Um, for me, for a while there, it was uh, the Fuzzy Bird Sonata by Yoshimatsu because I had the chance to play it for Yoshimatsu and I studied it with Sugawa. So I had a unique edge on that piece. I, I was one of the few Americans, if, if any, that had studied in Japan with Sugawa and that knew that piece and that had gained kind of the tips and tr tricks and um, as, as far as that piece. So that became a core of my program for a while because I, I felt like I had something to offer with that piece. I've kind of beaten it to death. I think I've performed that piece over 60 times. So it's, it's on the, you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> off my, my music stand for a little while. Um, but that's the thing is, is just really searching for what you have to offer, what music you believe in and, and figuring out how to convey that to your audience. Um, and then, you know, additionally, the more you perform, the more you're going to learn, of course. And if you approach each program with this mentality of, 
experimentation in a sense of, of researching and, and seeing how things go just make sure you learn something from every program you present pay attention to your audience get feedback listen and be open to all the feedback that you get because whether you agree with it or not whether it's coming from a trained musician or not the fact is is that's the person that's going out and paying to, to listen to music and those right. are th that's your audience those are the people whose insight you want to listen to well that's the that's the interesting thing uh, a lot of a lot of recitals that we end up doing you know uh, let's take for instance a uh, we do we do uh, something that is along the traditional lines and we're we're programming say a scaramouche a um, and uh, and and maybe maybe I don't know uh, the, the the Paul Maurice tableau happens to be on there just as a, you know, it's a light concert, but somebody ends up um, ends up putting on uh, so, something of a little bit more, um, uh, maybe a little more uh, angry sound, like say, uh, Christian Lobo's Hard or something like that, right? Bum ba dum dum, you know, and and we get we get going, and the interesting thing is, I'll find that in a in a recital like that. You'll, you'll all of a sudden get a. Uh, there's of course an appreciation for for the um, the nice sounding, and and consonant, um, uh, tableau and scaramouche, but you'll get a reaction uh, off of off of the something that's maybe new and different for that audience member. Absolutely. And so I. I have to say, you, it, the the idea isn't always to shock your audience. That's never that's uh, that shouldn't be that shouldn't be the point. Um, however, some musicians do that and are very successful. So I'm not going to knock it. Um, but I think I do, it's all about it's all about balance, though. You can have okay. those aspects to your recital. There's nothing wrong with that. You, you know, I, I do countless um, outreach concerts for middle school, for high school, for for retirement communities, and and one of the things that that I've really grown to understand is that they appreciate those moments in a concert, but you don't go off and give an entire recital of, of that kind of repertoire. You give them music that they can relate to, that they can understand that you, you, you grab their attention with. And then when you have their attention, you talk about the, you know, Christian Loeb is hard and you give them some insight into the music, some key points to listen for so that they know what to expect. So that that shock factor, it's still there. Trust me, these guys who have been listening to Beethoven and Bach their whole lives, they're still going to be shocked by Loba, but they have something to listen for. They have something to pay attention to, and they're going to appreciate the music so much more. I, um, what was it? It was uh, Tanada's Mysterious Morning uh, was performed in a mm. recital, and it was for a bunch of non-musicians, and they loved it because, one, it's short and it's accessible, but two... The, the performer gave the audience insight into the music itself, gave them something to listen to, to, to latch on to. And that's, that's so crucial when, when you're talking about programming is, is that balance. And it's, it's gaining the trust of the audience, gaining the appreciation and admiration of the audience so that they trust you on that reach piece. And that's, I'm, I'm giving a concert coming up in, in January for, sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, go ahead. No, oh, um, yeah. I'm I'm giving a concert in in January for Astral, and it's my debut on their their center series recital. And um, Philadelphia is, is is a bit traditional in in regards to my experiences there and, and the music that they appreciate. Um, but the the fact is is I'm I'm going to play some some modern music that's a little bit you know out there for for that kind of audience. But I'm using you know Frank's violin sonata to balance it out. So I'm going to play Franck's violin sonata say yes I agree with you I have the same concept for what beautiful art music is I appreciate this kind of music I have something to offer and when when we communicate on that common ground they'll be so much more open to hearing Roshan Adizadi's street legal because they'll know that we're not so far apart on how we think about music I just have a different exposure to it I, I have right. these, these other pieces that I'm aware of that you're not aware of, but if you thought about them in this way, maybe you'd enjoy them more. And that's the thing. If, well, you, if you balance your program and if you, you offer it in the right way, you present it in the right way, any audience in any setting can appreciate any kind of music. Well, and that's the whole concept of uh, the, even the idea of the word programming is, is the fact that there's thoughtfulness put into it. It's not just a... Um, a smattering, as you had mentioned before, of your greatest hits that you've ever wanted to play in your entire life. 
And, uh, you know, I've had a few students who want to do that. I'm like, that none of those pieces go together. It doesn't tell any story. And, and, and not, not that a program has to tell a story, but it definitely tells a story about you. Absolutely. And that's something a lot of people don't, don't realize, even from the very, very basic standpoint of programming is, you know, length of pieces. What are you going to open with? What's a good closer? You know, you don't open with the Franck Sonata. Right. You know, if you're, if you're going to play the Franck Violin Sonata, you don't open with it. You don't open with the Bach Chaconne because how the hell do you follow a piece like that? So you think about what is the very first experience I want my audience to have with me? Is it talking? Do I want to get up there and talk first or do I want to play first? What piece do I want to close the first half with? What piece do I want them to be thinking about before they decide whether they're coming back for more? What's the last piece I want them to hear? Because that's going to be the most clear and immediate impression they have of my playing is the very last piece of the program. You know, just, just taking all these things into account, developing a balanced program in, in length, in variety. Um, you know, do you have an play, encore ready so that if that last piece doesn't go well, you can leave them with something else? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can't tell you. In, in Asia, encores are, are standard. Like, not here. You know, in, in the U.S., it's very much based on, on the program and, right. and how receptive the audience is to it. But in Asia, unless... I mean, unless you give, like, the world's worst performance, you have to have um, an encore ready. And I still remember one of my most memorable experiences in Tokyo was listening to the Pacifica Quartet. And they performed an incredible recital. I mean, Grammy Award-winning string quartet. They're fantastic. If you, if you don't know them, check them out, Pacifica Quartet. Um, <clears throat> but they played, what was it, the Smetna Quartet for the end of time. And um, they bowed and walked off stage and came back on to bow again. And this happened three times. And then we realized they were very embarrassed because they didn't prepare an encore. So they replayed the fourth movement of the Smetna. And it was fantastic, but it was what we had just heard. So anyway, again, back to, to knowing the context of your performance. In Asia, if you're performing, you, you better be sure you have one to two encores ready. I remember I, I told Tim McAllister that when I arranged a tour for him in Japan. And he had, I think, three encores. And at the very least played two of them but in most of his performance i think played all three and they're short they're not the same as encores are here it's not all about flash not everyone's getting up there and playing monty's charta some people are playing bach air but it's about having that that sigh of relief of a, a, a brief gesture of appreciation when your audience is you know standing up and cheering for you and they want a little bit more but again it's just like about that. being prepared knowing knowing, knowing the context yeah i mean if you're going to take the hundreds of hours of time to invest to practice Take the thirty minutes yeah. to <laughs> to think about the programming, right? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or longer. Well, know. and I think, mm. yeah. yeah, and not not to just completely uh, tee off here, and I, I hope I'm not going to piss off too many people with this, but I think one of the the biggest epidemics in our field for saxophonists is is a. a is difficulties in programming. So much of what we do is is based in academia, is based in in the institution. So much of the programming that that we're kind of bred with is in the academic setting. So the the Berrios, the Zanakis, um, you know, the Stockhausens that we all have to study and that we all do, and that a lot of us grow to appreciate, and I certainly do. I think you know that's some of the the greatest music out there. I love Zanakis. Um, but anyway, the point is, is we all learn that and we play our, our masters or our DMA recital. And, you know, as saxophonists, especially since we're on a collegiate track, we don't have orchestral positions. A lot of the concertizing that we do follows academia. We're not mm -hmm. all performing 100 concerts a year. You know, most of us, our performance experience comes after the degree. So we get out into the real world and we have the experience of programming degree recitals. And then we see saxophonists going out there playing 60 to 90 minute concerts of, you know, spectral music. And I mean, themed concerts are kind of a different story, but in most situations, your audience is not going to respond to that. And it's because we're so trapped in this institutionalized training, we don't realize the rest of the world doesn't work like that. Violinists don't work like that. Pianists don't work like that. They have the experience of performing in, in a lot of different situations that, that we don't have. So my, my point is, is get outside of this academic bubble, get outside of this approach to programming, this, this, this concept of, of, um, of, of, of intellectual music and, and learn what an audience is looking for. Research the, the concert series you're playing on and, and look at what kind of music they're used to listening to and what they're expecting and then if you really believe in in stockhausen that's your your niche that's your your stick and you want to present music like that figure out the right context figure out a balanced program so that you can present music like that and someone will appreciate it instead of just 
you know, putting their hands over their ears because they're listening to an hour of spectral music when they've never heard a minute of it in their life. Well said. Rant over. <laughs> <laughs> well said. I think I think uh, I've got a couple of couple of students who at UNLV who are getting ready for their junior recitals this year and i'm looking forward to them listening to this and and (laughs) (laughs) just just even even so just getting a chance to like take this into perspective for some of uh not that they have too big of a choice in in the whole matter but (laughs) i I mean i and i i want to just you know take a step back and say that i'm i'm this this isn't meant to attack my colleagues and my peers a lot of which i admire a lot of whom i admire and are doing the right things it's that my personal experiences have led me to believe that people do appreciate this music people do under understand and admire pieces like what we're discussing right now but you have to present it in the right light you can't just go out there and do two hours of the same kind of music for me toning down my program or balancing my program so that they appreciate a piece like Albright. Because let's face it, to non-saxophonists, Albright is out there. That's f- it is. weird yeah. music. You but. know, to us, it's like, wow, that's tame. That's like Bozza Aria. Um, and it's, a, I mean, that's, I think, one of the best pieces ever written for saxophone. It's it's great music that I believe in. Right. But to non-saxophonists, that is really trippy out there music. And, and you know, like we're discussing, it's about finding the situation or, or sorry, cultivating, creating yeah. the situation that your audience will love a piece like Albright. You know, like I, I played the yeah. second movement of Albright in, an, in a concert over the summer, and I talked about the piece first, and I talked about my personal right. experience with the piece. And, and I'm not fortunate enough, like like someone like Tim McAllister, to have known Albright and collaborated with him, but I have my own personal history with the piece. Um, I, I don't want to get into this, but I had a grandmother that passed, that passed away, and I dedicated a performance of this to her. Um, so th- this piece has played a role in, in who I am as a person for, for years. And just talking about that, that experience that I've had with the piece personally helped the audience gain so much insight into what I was thinking as a performer and what I was feeling as a performer. And it helped them share the emotions that I was feeling. And I'm not lying. You know, we, we say this a lot. I've heard a lot of musicians talk about this, and this is one of the times that I'm, I'm, I'm being genuine, is that, you know, 10 people in the audience were, were in tears. Right. You know, a few of them even before I started playing because they saw how passionate I was about the music. And that's the thing is, is like we keep saying over and over and over again is just know your audience. Know how to make things accessible to them. Don't worry about what is and what isn't accessible. Worry about how to make things appreciated by the audience. And that's where sometimes um, – that's sometimes in talking to some people, you know, they – some people try to manufacture that moment or that type of – um, a programming style uh, where they're, they're trying to manufacture the emotion or other things. But I got to tell you, you have a connection to the music that you're playing and it's valid and, and there's an authenticity due to your choice. And, and, uh, and if it means something to you, it means something to you well, and it will mean something to the audience. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And that, and that's the thing when I'm, when I'm off there programming and, and, people you know saxophonists but i think we're all guilty of this we judge people based on the repertoire we choose hey younger guys that's one thing that that a lot of teachers won't tell you a lot of professionals won't tell you you are judged you are defined as a musician at least 50 percent by the repertoire you choose not just how you play it that's one thing i was never told and i wish i had been told um, but the repertoire you choose defines you because you're in a sense saying when you go out and perform on stage that this is music you believe in, whether you're admitted or not, whether you're knowing or not. So make sure that the repertoire that you choose is, is stuff that you believe in. And I mean, there's, you know, there's always the, the piece that you just have to kind of prove you can play, especially when it comes to degree recitals. But in general, know what it is that you have to offer artistically and decide and determine how you can do that in this in a concert setting. That's what programming is in a nutshell. And with that, I think uh, I think we're going to go ahead and uh, put a pin in it. And so, John, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to share your insights and, uh, on this program. Uh, for the master class today i hope uh, i hope a lot of people get get something out maybe it just stoked something for you um i thank you for all your contribution and what you've done uh and your and, and and i hope to have you back on 
Thanks, Mark. soon. It's, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And you too, Eric. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. It's very valuable, good, good advice. <laughs> thanks. That's no, just insight based on my own experiences. Yeah. Hopefully, especially for some of the younger guys, it's, it's beneficial. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I'm Mark MacArthur, and uh, this is the Modern Saxophonist Podcast. You can find us at themodernsaxophonist.com. You also can find us uh, by emailing us at themodernsaxophonist at gmail.com. Uh, John, uh, we can find you at your website. You mind giving that? Sure. It's jonathanwintringham.com. And then if you Google that, you can find all my related social media pages and anything you need to know. Well, with that, guys, thanks a lot. And that was your Monday Masterclass. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Modern Saxophonist Podcast. You can find us at www.themodernsaxophonist.com. We're also on Twitter at The Modern Sax.